Few silhouettes in aviation history are as unmistakable as that of a trijet. That third engine, embedded in the tail, breaking the traditional symmetry of passenger aircraft, became the visual symbol of an entire era. Between the 1960s and 1990s, aircraft like the Boeing 727, McDonnell Douglas DC-10, MD-11, and the elegant Lockheed L-1011 TriStar graced airports worldwide with their distinctive tail-mounted third-engine design. It was an unprecedented achievement and a significant advancement in aeronautical engineering. The Boeing 727 achieved 1,832 units produced, far exceeding the initial sales target of 250 aircraft and remained in production for 22 years. Today, these machines have virtually disappeared from commercial skies, relegated to museums, specialized cargo operations, or the role of historical curiosities. But why did they emerge? Why did they dominate for decades? And why did they disappear so completely? If you're also passionate about the world of aviation, consider subscribing to the channel and supporting our team. In 1960, a revolutionary decade for commercial aviation, the world had just entered the jet age, leaving behind the great propeller-driven aircraft. The new turbojets and turbofans promised unprecedented speed, altitude, and comfort. But there was a fundamental problem. The engines of the era simply weren't powerful enough and more importantly, they weren't reliable enough. In the early days of jet aviation, engines delivered between 14,000 and 20,000 pounds of thrust, with more advanced models reaching about 40,000 to 50,000 pounds by the end of the 1960s. It seemed like a lot, but it was still far from sufficient for two engines alone to propel a heavy aircraft across the Atlantic. If one of two engines fails over the ocean, the aircraft must continue flying safely to an alternate airport. And here's the dilemma. Available engines weren't reliable enough for regulators to allow twin-engine aircraft to venture far from dry land. The alternative was four-engine aircraft, planes like the Boeing 707 or Douglas DC-8. With four engines, losing one represented only 25% of total power, leaving ample safety margin. But four-engine aircraft had their own problems. They were expensive to purchase, expensive to operate, consumed fuel voraciously, and were too large for many routes. Using a 707 between New York and Chicago was like using a jackhammer to crack a walnut. It was in this void that trijets found their purpose. Three engines offered redundancy. Losing one left 66% of power, economy, less than four engines, and operational flexibility. But there was a regulatory obstacle that would make trijets not just useful, but absolutely necessary. Today, it's common to see a twin-engine Boeing 777 crossing the Pacific on 12-hour flights over open ocean. But until the mid-1980s, this was completely prohibited. The reason? The 60-minute rule, which would evolve into ETOPS, Extended Range Twin Engine Operational Performance Standards. In the 1960s, twin engine aircraft were restricted to a 60-minute diversion area. At any point on the route, the aircraft couldn't be more than one hour of flight time from an alternate airport. It sounds reasonable, but it had enormous consequences. Consider the North Atlantic, one of the world's most lucrative routes. The distance between the American East Coast and Europe ranges between 3,000 and 3,500 nautical miles, or 5,556 to 6,482 kilometers. With the 60-minute rule, a twin-engine aircraft would need to follow routes well to the north, passing through Iceland or the Azores, always within a 60-minute radius of an airport. For airlines, the solution was clear – expensive four-engine aircraft or trijets. Regulations of the time severely restricted twin-engine aircraft over the ocean, but allowed three-engine aircraft like the DC-10 and L-1011 TriStar to fly direct routes across the Atlantic, since one failure still left two operational engines. This reduced time and fuel consumption, while twin-engine aircraft had to make long detours. This regulatory advantage was the very reason for long-range trijets to exist. Without it, the economic argument would have been much weaker. With it, trijets became indispensable. 
But the market wasn't just about transatlantic flights. There was an entire category of operations that needed another solution. During the late 1960s and throughout the 1970s, more Boeing 727s were built per year than any other jet aircraft in history. Launched in 1963, the 727 was designed for short and medium distance domestic flights operating at airports with short runways. In the United States of the 1960s, many medium-sized cities had runways of 5,000 to 6,000 feet or 1,524 to 1,829 meters, instead of the 10,000 feet that larger jets needed. The 727 changed the game by combining jet performance with the ability to operate at these smaller airports. With three engines mounted at the rear, the 727 had clean wings, allowing enormous flaps that dramatically reduced landing and takeoff speeds. It could enter and exit runways that would leave a 707 stranded. Airlines loved its versatility. It flew short routes economically, but had the range to cross the country with one stop. It could operate at JFK or at regional airports that had never seen a jet. And it could be configured in dozens of ways, from 189 seats to luxurious executive configurations. While the 727 dominated domestic routes, the DC-10 and L-1011 TriStar filled another gap. The Boeing 747 offered 400 seats, but many international routes didn't have the demand to fill it. The DC-10 and L-1011 were wide-body aircraft capable of carrying between 250 and 380 passengers, perfect for medium-demand transcontinental and transoceanic routes. They offered wide-body comfort, three-engine economy versus four, and operational freedom without ETOPS restrictions. But these aircraft, despite being similar, represented different design philosophies that would reveal unique engineering challenges. Placing three engines on an aircraft seems simple, but in practice, it's a fascinating puzzle. With two engines, the solution is obvious, one under each wing. With four, two under each wing. But with three, you create inherent asymmetry that must be managed. All trijets adopted the same solution. Two engines under the wings and the third embedded in the rear fuselage integrated into the vertical stabilizer. This kept the center of gravity centered and freed the wings for sophisticated flaps. But it created a problem, how to feed the rear engine with air. A jet engine needs constant and uniform airflow. When you place an engine inside the rear fuselage, you need a duct to bring air to it. The DC-10 opted for the straightforward solution, a straight duct passing vertically through the stabilizer. The engine was mounted above the fuselage, externally visible. It had the advantage of simplicity, less pressure loss, less weight, easier to maintain. But the exposed engine created additional drag. The L-1011 adopted a more sophisticated solution, the S-duct. The engine was completely embedded, invisible except for the air intake and exhaust nozzle. Air traveled through an S-shaped duct that contoured around the internal structure. The result was a much cleaner and aerodynamically efficient external line. The TriStar was beautiful. But this elegance had a price. The S-duct was more complex, heavier, and more difficult to manufacture. Worse still, it was harder to maintain. Any engine service required access through special panels. The TriStar was the most advanced aircraft of its generation, packed with electronic systems years ahead. It had automatic landing, automated descent control, lower deck galley facilities, but all this sophistication made the aircraft expensive to produce. If trijets were born from the limitations of 1960s engines, it was inevitable they'd die when those limitations disappeared. And that's what happened in the 1980s and 1990s, when turbofan engine engineering took a leap that would transform commercial aviation. In the 1980s, a new generation of high-bypass turbofans began entering service, the Pratt & Whitney PW4000, General Electric CF680, and Rolls-Royce RB211-524 represented dramatic technological leaps. Not only did they generate more thrust, 
60,000, 70,000, up to 90,000 pounds, 267 to 400 kilonewtons in the most powerful versions, but they did so with superior efficiency and reliability that would have seemed like science fiction a decade earlier. The difference was in the fundamental design. High bypass turbofans divert most of the air around the core instead of passing everything through the combustion chamber. But the real game changer was reliability. The new engines had sophisticated electronic monitoring systems that detected problems before they became critical. Failure rates plummeted. A modern engine operated thousands of hours between significant failures. Statistics showed shutdown rates measured in events per millions of hours. This extraordinary reliability completely changed the safety calculation that justified trijets. If the probability of one engine failing was minuscule, and of two failing simultaneously was astronomically small, then why carry the weight and complexity of a third engine? The answer was clear, no reason at all. Twin-engined aircraft equipped with these new engines weren't just as safe as trijets, they were often safer because they had fewer systems to fail. And they were drastically more economical, consuming 15 to 25% less fuel per seed kilometer. The introduction of E-TOPS in 1985 was one of the most important moments in commercial aviation. In 1985, the FAA granted Transworld Airlines permission to operate a flight between Boston and Paris using a twin-engine Boeing 767, marking the beginning of the ETOPS era. The FAA initially granted ETOPS 120 certification, allowing the 767 to operate up to 120 minutes from an alternate airport. It was double the previous limit, sufficient to open most transatlantic routes, previously exclusive to trijets and four-engine aircraft. As twin-engine aircraft accumulated millions of hours without incidents, certifications were expanded. ETOPS 180 became standard. Eventually, ETOPS 207 allowed sufficient operations to cross virtually any point of the oceans. The most modern certifications reach ETOPS 370, allowing twin-engine aircraft to fly any world route without restrictions. The impact was devastating for trijets. Suddenly, a Boeing 767 or Airbus A300 could fly the same routes as a DC-10 but consuming significantly less fuel and costing less to operate. For new routes, the choice was obvious. Boeing capitalized with the launch of the 777 in the mid-1990s, with just two colossal engines, each capable of generating up to 115,000 pounds, 512 kilonewtons of thrust, the 777 could carry more passengers, fly farther, and consume less fuel than any trijet, and it was ETOPS certified from the start. Airbus launched the A330, a twin-engine wide-body offering capacity and range comparable to trijets but with two-engine economy. Airlines placed orders en masse. It was a complete paradigm shift. Twin-engine aircraft were no longer an economic compromise. They were the superior choice for routes of any distance. The symbolic blow came from the 727 itself, replaced by stretched versions of the 737. Production of the 727 ended in September 1984, after 22 years, and by the end of the 1990s, most in passenger operation had been retired. DC-10 deliveries totaled 446 aircraft compared to 250 TriStars. Disappointing numbers, Lockheed, after ending L-1011 production, withdrew completely from the commercial aircraft business. McDonnell Douglas continued, but was absorbed by Boeing in 1997. The 727 began disappearing in the late 1990s. Part of the problem was age. Many were 20, 25, even 30 years old, but the decisive factor was noise. The JT-8D engines were notoriously loud, and with stricter regulations, it became unfeasible to operate them on many routes. Many aircraft found a second life in cargo transport. Companies like FedEx, UPS, and DHL operated fleets of converted 727s. But even this career was limited. Fuel and maintenance costs made operations unprofitable. Today, only a few dozen 727s remain in operation, mainly in specialized operations. The DC-10 and L-1011 followed similar trajectories. During the 1990s, it was still common to see them on transatlantic routes for major carriers, 
but as the 777 and A330 entered service, their days were numbered. American Airlines retired its last DC-10 aircraft in 2000. Delta kept its L-1011s until 2001. One by one, major carriers said goodbye to trijets, in ceremonies that often included special and nostalgic flights. Some DC-10s found a second life in cargo. FedEx operated and still operates a significant fleet of converted DC-10s. With large cargo doors and capacity for large pallets, they proved to be effective platforms. But even here, the numbers are declining rapidly. The L-1011s weren't as lucky in cargo. The sophisticated design and advantage in passenger transport became a disadvantage in conversion. The S-duct occupied valuable cargo space. Additionally, exclusive dependence on Rolls-Royce RB211 engines made maintenance more complex and expensive. Trijets were exactly what aviation needed when they were created, an elegant solution to real problems of engine power, reliability, and safety regulations. They weren't whims or design errors, but pragmatic and inevitable responses to the limitations of their era. But technology is relentless in its march forward. When engines evolved and became powerful and reliable enough, when ETOPS opened the skies to twin-engine aircraft, trijets lost their reason to exist. Today, when you see a Boeing 777 or Airbus A350 crossing oceans with just two engines, carrying more passengers, flying farther and consuming less fuel than any trijet ever could, you're witnessing the natural evolution of aviation.